I'm born and raised in Brooklyn, New York, and Best Eye. That made me who I am today and it gave me some skills and some talents and some resolve. People are outsiders to their own industry. And how it happens is people just say, I know 10% of something and I'm just I'm going to just try to ride that. That's not strategy. When people tell me that Dre is just slow, I know that they think it's slow because they probably only have one contact at the port. But if you're working with an association, a membership, you just sitting at the barbecue all the time. So nobody is chasing freight. Nobody's using low boards. They're giving it to you because you're in the end. All right, hustle fam, hustle fam. We are back in the A, and when I'm in A town, I gotta check in with my peoples. And uh, for all y'all who know me, you know this 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 sister is very close and near and dear to my heart. You know we met a few years ago and we become like family. So uh, I had to bring her back on the show, man, to just catch up and see what's been going on in her life. She's been building an amazing business an amazing education program and with Agate Solutions. And she's been doing a ton, just a ton of work and just really killing it in the area of global logistics and international trade. So some of you may know who this is already, but uh, Bashak, welcome back. To Truck and Hustle. Well, it's good. It's so good to be back. I feel like I just came back into like my cousin crib for Thanksgiving. Mm, yeah, that's that's definitely the vibe. So we've we we've been talking for like three hours off <laughs> off camera. So I don't even know what we're gonna talk about now. But one thing about us, when we get to going, it is always gonna be it's always gonna be up. So right, we know we're gonna drop jewels. Or, right. I'm, I, well, you gonna drop jewels. We're just gonna <laughs> sit back and and, and let you do what you do. So just for context, man, you know, for people who don't know you, know who you are, just kind of introduce yourself. Tell the people about your credentials. Tell them about, you know, just just a quick five, five second. Who is Shaq? So my name is Shaquana Teasley. Uh, professionally, people call me Shaq. My credentials are somewhat long, but <laughs> I'll try to summarize it quickly. Uh I have a master's degree in labor relations from the University of New Haven. I'm a certified custom specialist. I am a duty drawback specialist. I sit on many boards. I sit on the board of directors for Troops to Logistics to make sure that veterans has a transitioning mechanism into the industry. I also sit on the board of directors for Women in International Trade, supporting women in international trade. Most recent appointment has been to the National Black Chamber of commerce, where I am supporting international affairs. I am the chairwoman to that. And formally sitting on the chamber for Pakistan as well, where I was supporting international trade negotiations. Mm, that's a lot. Uh, that's a, a lot, lot to digest. So for the layperson, what does all that mean? Break it down for us. If, 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 it's, if it's a third grader listening to right now, what, what, what is it that you do with all those, all those credentials, all these accolades, what, what, do you, what do you do with that? So people think that credentials and all those accolades mean that you somehow sit higher on some type of food chain or there's some hierarchy and just like that, you've become the highest peer of that tier of that. And that's not what I think at all. So if I was explaining that to someone that had no idea what any of that was, what I would say is that has to hold me accountable. All those accolades are there to make sure that I am holding myself accountable to making sure I'm never part of the problem. Mm -hmm. And when I say never part of the problem, I mean that those credentials award me seats in rooms where you have to be a certain tier of caliber of education to get in the room. But then it's my responsibility to get there and crack the door open so that there's another Shaquana as well. So it's not only me. And I hold myself accountable to that. So holding those positions mean that I'm responsible for making sure that somebody else has the same availability to those rooms that I now have. No doubt. And it didn't come easy. You no. come from very humble beginnings. I do. Um, Brooklyn, New York. All day. As we are both Brooklynites. Best style tell, tell, <laughs> tell, 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 tell the people a little bit about your background. Just to, again, put context. We're going to get into some, 
right, some right. things, but I want people to know who you are who, who don't know who Shaq is. So if you don't know who Shaq is, let me take it way back. So my family and friends don't know who Shaq is at all. My family and friends know me as Snapper. That's my childhood name. My nieces and nephews know me as Auntie Snapper. I'm still Snapper today. Professionally, people call me Shaq. But I'm born and raised in Brooklyn, New York, and Best I, some of the projects to be exact. I uh, was there my entire life, born and raised there. I'm one of eight kids. That alone was not easy, as you could imagine. We grew up in a three-bedroom apartment. And people always try to say they from a certain state and they never really want to say the city. I've learned that in my <laughs> career. They'll be like, oh, I'm from Michigan. No, you from Detroit. <laughs> right? It's like, so I'm never like, I'm from New York City. No, I'm from Brooklyn. That's I'm right. from the style. Because that made me who I am today. And it gave me some skills and some talent and some resolve about myself that there is no institution that can provide me with. So if I could say anything to anybody that comes from those type of situations, don't let nobody make you feel like that's something that you gotta hide behind. You know, it's it's fine, it's cool. In fact, it's dope to come from where you come from. Don't let nobody make you feel like, you know, that ain't nothing you could say. Say that and say it proudly because it represents a whole nother accolade. Can't nobody teach me how to be from Brooklyn. I have another type of skill that can't nobody provide, right? That's it's right. just, it's innate. It, it, it's built in me. And I grew up in the 80s. So I grew up in the crack era. I grew up back in the day where the dudes walked around with cardboard boxes and they unfolded them <laughs> and they had the love hate, right? So they was like Radio <laughs> Raheem. And they was, you know, it was B Street and it was break dancing in the block. It was jams outside. It was, you know, opening up the Johnny Pump. That's the fire hydrant, mm. right? So it was good times, but it was also a do or die era, right? It was it was very much, you better understand what protect your neck is. You better understand where you shouldn't be at certain times. But at the same time, it also helped me understand what protection me at a higher level because the same people that somebody else from the outside might feel fear of, I knew that that was a protective arm and that I was going to be good on the block and I was going to be straight on the block and I wasn't going to want or need for anything. And when I say want or need for anything, I mean down from the Coco Pina man coming through with ices or Mr. Softy rolling up with the ice cream with the sprinkles for a dollar, <laughs> right? All the way to if I needed a triple fat goose for the summer because it's brick outside and I don't know how I was going to go down. My mother was an evangelist of a Pentecostal church. So we stayed in the word, you know, people used to make fun and be like, yo, the 18 van outside. <laughs> Cause my mother used to roll up to the school with the gospel music playing. And my pops was on the block. My pops used to work for sanitation at one point. You know, he also did three car Molly outside, you mm, know, one so, of them guys, huh? Yeah, he was a yeah, yeah, yeah. He was a three car Molly guy, you know, and you know, he was very well respected. In the neighborhood, he was also a protecting arm in the neighborhood, very community oriented. And, you know, he was, a, he you know, we came from a big family, so nobody really wanted to have no problems over here. Uh, but at the same time, I knew that there was something more for me. I just knew that because I just didn't want to feel that defensive my whole life. Like I was always on guard, like who in the elevator, who in the back way, watch behind the back, who in the back of the store. I'm just trying to get some chips while I'm worried about who in the back of the store. Cause it's, it's probably a number hole back there. Right. Y'all probably don't know what that is, but, <laughs> <laughs> but my point is it was, it was a trying time. Right. And then, you know, we had a big family. So my aunts and my uncles, they all lived within other projects around Brooklyn and it was like six or eight of them. So we was, we was, we was quite deep and, Unfortunately, you know, we had to do with a lot of stuff that was products of our environments because people want to try to outcast us for that. Like, oh, no, you choose that. Some things are not choosing. You're just trying to, you know, survive. And, you know, so a lot of the women or girls in the family were teen moms. A lot of the guys was in and out of jail. So you see them some summers and some summers you don't. Uh, a lot of family was strung out because of the crack era. And, you know, I, I thank God for the mother that I had because she was so grounded in the word. I thought she was trying to beat it down our throats, right? But what she was trying to make sure is, is that no matter how hard it got, you knew that you had to always come back to your root. And your root wasn't a person. It was always spiritual. It was always God. So no matter what I've gone through or where I've had to be, I always knew if nothing else, you know, God was never going to forsake me. And I think that makes me a little different in regard to my humble beginnings because I know that's not within my own might. Yeah. I know that everything that I've been able to accomplish has been just because God has favored me. 
No doubt. How'd you make it out that environment? So I actually turned 17, graduated high school, and moved out all in the same day. And I don't generally tell people that, and I can just say it here, <laughs> but um, I wasn't always proud of that because I felt like, I used to feel like it's not fair. Like everybody got to, like not everybody, but so many people got to go to colleges. They got to have the different world experiences. They got to pledge. And I was like, man, I'm out here trying to like really thug it out. And I was meeting so many people that was like, oh yeah, my kids are away at school. And I was like, how do they do that? So I felt like school would be the thing that kept me off the street. So I moved out when I was 17. I actually graduated high school when I was 16 and I emancipated myself mm. and I began to take my next year classes at night. So I didn't tell my parents I graduated. I led them to believe that I was failing everything and either go to night school, Saturday school, summer school. Yeah. But I was working at Bed Bath & Beyond oh, that's wild. <laughs> doing inventory at night <laughs> in Macy's in the day. So I was working two full-time jobs. So by the time I was 17, I had like $18,000, which that's a lot. Yeah. Back in 95. I mean, it's a lot to some people bathroom. now. Yeah, it's a lot right now. <laughs> right, 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 right. So I had like $18,000 stash and I got my first place. I had stuff on layaway. I don't know if y'all know what that layaway. is. Layaway. <laughs> Yo, that shit. But I had back furniture layaway. on layaway. And if y'all don't know what layaway is, let me just tell you. Yo. <laughs> it's the monthly payment for everything. That's right. That's <laughs> Couches. Right. Whatever. Whatever. Lamps, layaway. brooms. Everything, <laughs> everything was on layaway. So by the time I was Yo, moving layaway. out, I had everything. That's crazy. Got right. It. So I, I, so I moved out early, but then I was like, all right, now I'm out here now with that 18000 going to last me how long? So I was working retail in the day and I was like, man, I want to go to college somehow because I felt like too much idle time was going to have me on the block because that's what I knew. I knew very well how to flip coins quickly. And I knew that if I didn't do something with my time quick, then I was going to be able to fall into that even quicker. Uh, but I never really had an issue academically. I always excelled academically. So I enjoyed school. Don't laugh. But, you know, I really <laughs> I enjoy it. I, I consider myself a scholar. I call my students Aggie scholars because we're scholastic, period. So I went to school at night and I started at my local community college. And don't knock community college. People always be like, oh, junior college. No, there's nothing wrong with junior college. It, it, it helped really build me to prepare me because I didn't know what college was like. So if I would have ended up on the campuses of Harvard, I really was ill prepared for that because the schools we went to didn't really prepare me for that. Mm. So I went to a junior college in Kings at Kingsborough College in Brooklyn, and I started a job pushing a mail cart. So that's real old school. Remember back in the day, you push a mail cart around and hand yes. out the mail. I yes. used to do that, and I made like nothing, like six dollars and ten cents an hour. Wow! So I knew that eighteen thousand was going to go real. That's quick. where everybody started, though. Like that <laughs> was like the entry level entry, entry level position. Like you could work your way up from. But that. the dope part about that is you meet everybody exactly because you walking around, you meeting the executives, yeah, you yeah, seeing yeah. they mail, you kicking it with them. Before you know it, you having lunch with certain people. <laughs> no you, doubt. You know that was a great spot. Right. So I was a mail clerk for an insurance company on right on the campuses of NYU. And they was just like, you know, there's other opportunities here. And I was like, like what? And they started telling me. So before I knew it, I was a claims examiner for an insurance company mm. processing claims and they paid for my associates. So I tell people all the time, especially my students, don't complain to me about opportunities that's not opening, because if you don't ask for what you want, nobody don't know. So, you know, back in the day, you would hear closed mouths don't get fed, right? right. So now I'd be like, ask for what you want. You have to tell me no. Tell me no, but I'm asking for what I want, right? Facts. So they asked them to pay for school. They never said no. I asked for one semester before I knew it. It was a two-year degree with books. Then I was like, okay, what I'm going to do about my bachelor's? Then 9-11 happened. I was there for 9-11. Mm. That was a huge impact on my life, seeing that, being right there and seeing that. And I asked them if they'll pay for my bachelor's. And they said, we'll pay for one semester. Next thing I know, I have my bachelor's, books and all. So I was able to get my associates and my bachelor's without any debt at all. I didn't oh. owe them any time. I didn't owe them anything. And um, I'm always grateful to God for that because I don't know anybody else that has gotten over $500,000 worth of education for free. And I have. I got mm. my master's for free. I got all my certifications for free. And I never owed anybody any additional time. No doubt. But you have to thank yourself for the execution. I'm still tired. And God giving you the power to execute. But damn, you know, because people could get the opportunity, but you got to execute on it. 
It is. So, you know what I'm saying? I never really lived the college campus life, if that makes sense. So, yeah. I never knew what a college campus was like in the daytime. So, I worked in the day and went to school at night. And that's how I was able to get all my education. Right, right. All right. So, Global Logistics International Trade, that's what you specialize in. So, just really quick, how did you, how did that become your specialty? Where, where were you at prior? Before that, that that became your thing. Just talk about that real quick. So I'm gonna keep it a hundred with y'all. I was actually a social worker, and I went to I got my education in social work because I just felt like I could save everybody. I'm gonna take all the teen pregnant girls, everybody that's struggling in the projects, and I'm gonna put a cape on my back, and I'm gonna find Pleasantville for them. <laughs> It was, it's so unrealistic in theory, but I really thought I could make it happen. And then yeah. when I realized I was so low on the food chain and there were so many political figures and laws that I couldn't break through, the only impact I could make as, as a social worker was what I was making in my relationship with people I was working with directly. But I got a job at the welfare center. Okay. I used to work at the welfare center. And let me tell you, I was the best social worker ever. Let me tell you why. If you qualified for it, yeah, you it showing was love. You, you was getting love. You get in your metro card. Mm. You get in your food stamps. Mm. Who else need Medicaid? You get in Medicaid. Mm. I, it was if if you needed rent assistance, whatever. If you needed back money, furniture money. If it, they, I'm not over questioning you, right? If and there's always have, that one that will, right? That uh, ask want to know everything, want to know and all your I business. Used to listen to that all the time. <laughs> like that's not true. You don't really need that. You got a Gucci bag, right? Right. Somebody can go to Gucci. Where your baby daddy? Yet. <laughs> Somebody could go Gucci bag to homeless in 30 days. All right, guys, listen, before we continue the show, I got to give a shout out to our sponsor and our partner, OTR Solutions, formerly OTR Capital. But listen, guys, OTR is much, much more than just a factoring company. They provide so many solutions to help the small carrier not only get into business, but to stay in business and maintain, right? So you guys have to partner with them and check them out. Don't take my advice for it. Talk to their clients, right? Talk to their clients. Find out what the people are saying. Everybody will tell you the same thing. So make sure you give OTR Solutions a call at 470-900-3338 or click the link in the bio below. Make sure you check them out and tell them Truck and Hustle sent you. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Real For talk. real, right? Real people talk. always try to make it seem like what you have somehow represents wealth or rich or financial stability. There's people that are walking around with $15,000 on their body because that's what they had. And today they don't. Yeah. But if you woke up in the welfare center and you were seeing me, I was giving you everything you qualify for. As long as you can show me that you qualify for it, what is there to argue about? What am I overly questioning you about? No doubt. I, it didn't matter to me. You could have came in here with bags I never heard of. It didn't matter. So, And I worked at a distinct welfare center. The welfare center I worked for was specialized. They only took domestic violent cases and men that were in halfway houses, which means they came home from jail and they were in a halfway house. So it was a violent environment, but I grew up in a violent environment, so I never felt fear of that. I always was kind of like, these people from around the way, they need my help now. Right. And I was pretty young, but that was a great experience, even though that sound hectic and chaotic, it was. But I really felt like I was helping people. I was giving back. And then they changed our titles from caseworkers to job opportunity specialists. I'm like, but I'm not even giving nobody jobs. That's whack. Right, right, right. <laughs> uh, but then I took that real serious, right? So, you know, back in the day, you would highlight jobs in the newspaper. I started doing that for people I knew I would see again. Like, yo, you qualify for this. You qualify for that. And started helping people actually, let me do your resume over. And that really wasn't my job, but I felt like that was the impact, right? Yeah, yeah. So, I got, so then that led to me doing substance abuse. I did foster care and whew, that's a whole nother level of heart work. Your heart got to be in that for real. Uh, watching children that are victims of all types of different violence and that was just hard, right? For it was real. just hard in general. Yeah. And I remember once I had this, uh, I had a, a kid that was on my caseload and she was about 16, but she looked about 30. She had just been through so much in her life. She had gotten on a bus all the way from Florida to New York on her own. Oh, like wow. ran away from home and was like, I'm just going to thug it out and I'm going to figure it out. But she was on my caseload. And I was really helping her a lot with school and like getting her into like pre-qualifying college classes and stuff. And then one day we were sitting in the car and she said, 
she was like, yo, Miss Campbell, um, you know, I really appreciate what you're doing for me and I don't want to have to hurt you. I was like, what? Come again? She was like, you know, I'm in this gang around my way because oh, I ain't wow. used to living in New York and in order for them to protect me and keep me safe because I don't have no friends here, I just got to do stuff. So I felt like she was trying to say she was going to run up on me. So, right? So I was like, what else is she, you know, well, I'll not interpret this whatever way she's saying this, right? So... I was like, so, I, you know, I just literally, I was driving. I pulled over and, and heart to heart with her. I was like, so are you feeling pressured to physically cause me harm? Because I think I'm the only person really going hard for you out here. And she was like, I mean, I could steal your car instead. It wasn't even my car. It was the agency car. Right, right, right. She's like, I could steal your car instead, but I got to do something. So what's crazy was I was only like 23, so I wasn't so far removed from the street myself. Right, right. Where I was like, I promise you, you don't want these problems with me. <laughs> like, you don't really know me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So just enjoy your time with Miss Campbell, and right. we're going to be all right. And we never had an issue, and I was able to be with her for a few years. But when I moved from New York to Atlanta, I started looking for social work jobs, right? That's my skill. And I was like, I could find more people like her to kind of shift her mindset, right? Because I knew I made a big impact. On where her life was going to go. Yeah. And I got to Atlanta and I started interviewing and it was like, oh yeah, $28,000 a year. You got to have your own car. You're responsible for this county, this county, and this county. I was like, man, this is way harder than what I left New York doing. So I was like, nah, this is not going to work. So I just started going to temp agencies and that landed me a job at a trucking company at Yellow Freight. Mm. But I knew I wasn't trying to do nothing. I was like, oh, God, I do not want to drive a truck. They was like, no, 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 you ain't got to drive no truck. You just got to be the front desk. <laughs> and I was straight raw from Brooklyn. And I was like, that ain't going to work. But they was also a freight forwarder. They were doing exports to the Caribbean. That's how my career started. Got it. Got it. And what was your actual, you do? You said exports to the Caribbean? Mm -hmm. And what were you doing in that process? So back then, there was something called an SED. It's a shipper's export declaration. So it's a document that's required to export product outside of the U.S. Now it's called AES. Okay. Back Because it's automated now. Back then it was an actual physical document. And they needed somebody to complete these documents to qualify the product to be exported out of the product. So they had to classify all these goods. And I literally sat in this back terminal doing that. But while I was there, I used to see all the drivers come in for their physicals and drug tests. And... That, that was hard for me to watch because they were all minorities, but all the leadership and terminal managers were not. And I, because of the position I held, I got to sit in a lot of these meetings and I would hear them like, oh yeah, we breathe them well. I'm like, we breathe them well, right? And it was real like, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Breed them well? Breed them well. Okay. And, they would, and I felt like they would talk to and dealt with like cattle. Mm. And that was hard for me because I never seen anything like that. I had always worked in very corporate environments in New York. Even though I was in social work, it wasn't like what I was seeing in trucking. And right. I, I'd never seen people not dress professional for work, but they were drivers, so they shouldn't have to, right? They had to be comfortable. Uh, but I, I, seeing them be treated the way they were made me like, I just immediately had a disdain for anything labor intensive. Cause I had, I, it, it made me feel like if you did any type of labor intensive work, that's how you might be treated. Cause the warehouse workers was treated like that. Everybody that did labor intensive work was treated like that. Yeah. And it, and it really bothered me. So immediately I knew in my life, I was not doing anything that caused me any physical labor. Period. That's right. That's right. All right. So that kind of gives like a idea of, you know, how you started your career. Um, I want to kind of lay a foundation for people to understand what, you know, international trade is, right? And global logistics, which is what you do. And there's there's something that we talked about one time that kind of blew my mind. And I want you to kind of explain it now. You talked about how international international trade's origins are actually like in slavery. Correct. Right? And you were breaking that down. Can you, can you kind of talk about that? Like how at, during those times... That was international trade and how that kind of corresponds with what's, what still goes on today. Correct. Can you get into that? So this is hard for people to have this conversation. So I'm going to give the disclaimer now that it's difficult to talk about and it's difficult to listen to because that's not how we want to see mm -hmm. our ancestors. But 
Anyone that knows anything about freight and the movement of goods, whether it be domestic or global, understands what a bill of lading is. Would you agree? I, I would definitely agree. Okay. So there's no way that you don't understand what a manifest is. And unfortunately, our ancestors were on manifest as cargo. And people have said to me, well, one, at one point, supply chain is going to go away. Or global logistics is going to go away. Or international trade is going to go away. And that's crazy to me. Because the Boston Tea Party is international trade and logistics. Slavery as well. So people want to, I hear people often describe slavery as a mass migration. But migration is usually voluntary. So when you think about slavery, it's hard to not see the concept of cargo has no right. When we move the clothes that we have on, these pillows that are here, the microphones that we're talking into, that's freight. That's cargo. That's how people were moved. Unfortunately, the actual commodities are treated better. They're blocked. They're braced. They're protected. They're safe. And we were not. Yeah. Right. And our ancestors were not. So when people have this small notion and I call it small because you've got to be pretty small minded to think that one day supply chain is going away. That's insane. It can't go away. So we hear the word sustainability. That's sustainable. Goods have to trade because that is how the economy. Both domestic and abroad is determined for, to some extent. So let me give you an example. So we have to move goods around the world, right? But we have to do that in agreements with other nations. If we want avocados from South America, that doesn't mean that we don't organically grow avocados, but we can't mass produce them to feed the population here, especially not for Super Bowl, <laughs> right? Because we know we need our dip. That's right. So if we're going to import them from South America, we have to have an agreement when I say we, I mean the United States of America, federally, has to have an agreement with another country, which is a regulation, to make that happen. So there's a difference between global logistics and international trade, and I like to explain that. Please. Global logistics is actually the movement of the good. That's air freight. That's ocean freight. That's rail. That's domestic. People think that domestic is not part of global logistics, but it is because when a product is sourced from another nation, it has to go through a quality inspection in another country. A foreign inland has to occur. A foreign inland is from the manufacturing site to the vessel or to the airport in a foreign destination. So if a factory is making this dope hoodie in another country, how am I going to get these hoodies to the port to get them here. That's the foreign inland. That's still domestic for that country, mm. which is what we call drayage here or intermodal. So that's the movement of the goods. International trade is completely different, but they're cousins. So when you think about international trade, think a bit of the regulatory piece. Regulations have to be intact in for order for these goods to move. We can't just willy nilly be shipping goods around the world Otherwise, it'll be a big traffic jam. It's like saying that you can put 50 people in an Uber and everybody can make it to Orlando at the same time. That's <laughs> insane, right. right? That's logistics. So when you think international trade, think international trade compliance. Think U.S. customs law or customs law abroad. I'm an expert in customs law, customs regulation, which is 19 CFR. Whenever I say CFR, that's the Code of Federal Regulations. Many people that are in your audience are truck drivers, correct? Correct. Or own trucking companies. They're very familiar with domestic regulations. So 49 CFR is a domestic regulation, but distinct to hazmat. So when you think about the regulations behind the moves, that's some of international trade. In addition to that, it is the negotiation between two nations to actually trade the good. You might live in Jersey. I might live in Brooklyn. You may say, hey, Shaq, I love your Aggie hoodie. And I'm like, yo, I love your truck and hustle hoodie. He's like, yo, they don't produce these here. I'm like, they don't produce these here. We have to come to an agreement. All right, you can give me some of those and I'll give you some of these. How much you want for yours? This is how much I want for mine. 
and we can make an agreement. That's a small scale. So imagine that happening with raw materials. Mm. Like bamboo. When you ever seen bamboo growing out of the ground in Brooklyn? <laughs> it ain't going down. But it's wow in China. China is not growing wood, but they need pallets. Pallets can't come into the United States unless they're UN specified, meaning they're they have a certain type of chemical to make sure that pesticides are on it so that they don't infect the land. So how was that going to go down? We have to have an agreement with another country. Also, right now, many of you should be remembering during the Trump administration, we fell into what's called the Chinese trade war. People that's not following that should, because a lot of what you consume every single day was imported from China. That didn't go away with the Biden administration. It's still living under the Trump administration and today under the Biden administration. That means all these additional duties from goods that are coming from China has to be paid. How does that happen? We all understand what's happening in Russia. We're in the middle of major sanctions, correct? Yeah. That's international trade. So as a consumer, it shifts my mind. It should be shifting everybody's mind. When you buy stuff, you're not paying attention to what economy you're supporting. I do. When I vacation, I'm supporting the economies that I know I want to support. Some countries have agreements that are called free trade agreements. The United States has 14 free trade agreements. And free literally means free. It means that we can import goods for free, meaning duty free. Duty means taxes. You got to pay taxes every time something is imported. So let me give you an example of that. The Caribbean has something called the Caribbean Basin Act with the United States. The United States has deemed all the islands along the Caribbean basin as underdeveloped economically. In order to support that region of the world, the United States has said, hey, you can import your products into the United States for absolutely free, duty free, if they qualify. Some products may not qualify. If they qualify, what does that do to the region? It tells people like you and me, wow, you know what? I don't want to import from China because I got to pay additional 25% duty. I can't import from Russia. We're in the middle of a sanction. Mm -hmm. But if I get this from Jamaica or the Bahamas, I could bring it in duty free. So the savvy way to do that is to be very familiar with what commodities are raw materials in those countries. So I tell truck drivers all the time that when they say it's slow, or they say drayage is slow, it's because you're outside. You're an outsider. Don't be an outsider to an institution or to an industry that you call yourself an expert in. How are you going to be an outsider to something you call yourself an expert in? Let me tell you how. People are outsiders to their own industry. Mm. It's like it's like you bombarding the barbecue. Like you wasn't invited, but you get to show up and I'm going to still give you a burger. But you only get in a burger. <laughs> Don't come over here wanting the potato salad and all of that. Right. That happens all the time. And I tell people in domestic logistics, don't don't be a stranger to your cousin barbecue. You don't have to be like that. And how that happens is people just say, I know 10% of something and I'm gonna just I'm gonna just try to ride that. And that's not strategy. When people tell me that drayage is slow, I know that they think it's slow because they probably only have one contact at the port. Or they just got a twit car and they rolled up. That doesn't make sense. That's not strategy. But if you're working with an association, a membership, you're just sitting at the barbecue all the time. So nobody is chasing freight. Nobody's using low boards. They're giving it to you because you're in the in. Mm. A lot of us are working on the out. You're working at the hem of a garment when you could be the chess piece. That's right. crazy to me. So if I'm going to be an expert in global logistics and I'm going to be an expert in international trade compliance, I'm going to everybody's barbecue. I know everybody. They feel comfortable talking to me. I'm not asking them for anything. They know what I need already because we talked about that over burgers. Last 4th of July, I saw you for Thanksgiving. I'm exaggerating, but you see my point. Yeah. So when people say it's slow, that means that you are working outside your own industry. And that becomes a rat race. And that's not a place of peace. Like, I want to be peacefully paid. Peacefully paid comes from a place of rest as well. And that's both spiritual and in the natural sense, meaning that I know you well enough that I'm never going to cold call. I would never cold call nobody. Cold call and say what? Hey, guess what? My name is Shaq. You should know me. I'm not doing that. 
But I am going to say, hi, this is Shaquana. You might remember me as Shaq. We're both members of blah, blah, blah. We were both at the so-and-so-and-so conference. Do you remember me? They want to talk to you now because you're not outside. So if freight is slow, if drayage is slow, if intermodal is slow, if you can't find warehouse space, that means that you are getting at the bottom of the barrel freight in global logistics. Mm -hmm. It means that you are getting the phone call when they have nobody else. And that could be money. That could be money for a long time. But the concern is, is that sustainable? Yeah, yeah. So maybe for some carriers look listening to you and what you're saying makes total sense it could be like a capacity thing whereas those opportunities aren't afforded to them because they don't have the size right like maybe they could be a part of an organization but then you have these mega carriers that are part of the same organizations and they're getting all those opportunities they're eating them up which is still leaving them in the same kind of place like what, what would you say to that like how how do they play the game you join the organization but you're still small Right. So how do you navigate, navigate that? It's not size. It's really not size. I promise it's not. Let me, let me tell you, it's not size. So I call my students Agate Scholars. So Agate has approximately 500 students. We have a forever program, right? So you take our courses, we mentor you, we train you, we guide you, but we take you with us, right? So we're not an association or membership. We don't have a membership fee or anything like that, but I'm making sure that they are in a network with me. So when I go to the conference, you're sitting at my lunch table. I'm walking you around, introducing you to who you need to know. So People find, I hear the word shipper all the time and I'm not knocking shipper because it's a real term, right? Shippers are real, is real terminology, but I still think that's short term too. There's importers and exporters. Importers and exporters do not want to be trying to allocate freight every six months. They want to allocate freight three to five years mm. because they just don't want to be bothered with that. So when they trying to get a bid, they want to bid for the long term. So people have this misconception that I'm not big enough. I only got two trucks or I only got one truck that drive that one driver that's hazmat certified. You're still working outside your industry. You need to be with an organization that gets you to the larger organization. Like I hear people about trucking consortiums. I don't know, I'm not an expert in that, but I know that they operate in some of the same capacity with making sure that people can network and they use that volume to get larger capacity Correct. from what I understand. Yeah. So we work in that same form. I just came back from a large uh, international trade compliance uh, conference just recently, but I took my my top students with me. They had lunch with freight forwarders. They made deals right there. They knew when they left there, they had somebody that they can call that they were not cold calling. So Agate scholars will tell you, we don't do low boards and we don't chase freight. We don't have to. I put them in position to, to know my network. Now, let me be very clear about that. I have made some mistakes. In that. <laughs> We're going to call it a lesson learned Okay. where I hadn't always protected my network. Mm. My heart is just like, come get it, come get it. Because I see so many of us that don't, don't know. And it's things that I, I think as my skill set has increased, sometimes I have to remind myself to come down a little bit to where I used to be in my knowledge. Yeah. And in doing that, I find out like, wow, you don't know that? I didn't know that people didn't know that. I thought that everybody knew that. They don't. So sometimes being part of another network that gets you to the bigger network makes sense. And I can't say what that is for every single body by region, but I can say for Agate Scholars, they haven't had a slow season. My students don't have slow seasons. So when you say protected your network, are you saying that you, you may have... Uh made some introductions and people weren't necessarily ready prematurely prematurely yeah, so I have. what does it mean to be ready that's a great question so what does it mean to be ready ready is not something you can read on somebody's resume it's not on their linkedin profile it's not on their professional biography people tell me all the time that they've gone through mentorships that's like four weeks six weeks I cannot mentor you in global logistics and international trade for such a short duration of time. My program is either six months or one year. It takes me over 120 days to let my spirit know if you're worthy of the tables. And I don't mean the rooms, not a room, a small table for just lunch. And I think that my heart was ahead of my, my mind in that way. That's why I really do hold myself 
uh, to the regard of I over E now, intellect over emotion. Mm. Because my emotion to see us win, because of what I know that we all had to go through, including myself, I'm not so far removed from what that looks like in a hardship. So I want us to all come through and knock the door off the hinges. But I can't do that at the place where it jeopardizes my 21 years in the industry. That's right. And I can't do that. It's bigger than me now. I can't do that where it jeopardizes now what I can do for the other 500 people. So I'll give you an example. I had an Agus Scholar finish my courses. Uh, she was done in maybe, I'll give it less than a month. Maybe nah, My courses are usually at least six weeks. So I'll say like two months. And she was like, you know, I really got to get a job. I got to get a job, especially during COVID. She was in the education space making like $40,000 a year. So I was coaching her. And I was like talking to her Saturday mornings in the car with my kids, dropping them off at soccer, trying to get her ready because my heart was like, I know what it's like to make like $30,000, $40,000 a year. So I set her up with an interview. I mean, she had, all she had to do was show up for coffee at Starbucks. <laughs> That's the relationship I was putting her in front of. Yeah. And she didn't show up. And I'm blowing this girl up like she was my child. Right. Like, wait a minute, where's your level of accountability and integrity for the relationship? You should be protecting relationships before you even have them. Protect potential relationships. And you do that by what you look like before you open your mouth. That's right. I protect my relationship in every space I'm in now. But I had to learn that. And I'm glad that I had to learn it early, right? So, but she never showed up. By the time I got on the phone two days later, I was I was waiting to hear like the car fell off the bridge, the plane fell out the sky. <laughs> she was like, I had my me and my boyfriend got into an argument and I almost, you know, we was about to break up. They didn't live together, they didn't have no kids together. That's not even my I shouldn't even know that, right? I don't yeah. even want to judge nobody relationship. Sure. I was just like, what? This is the VP of the largest freight forwarder in the world. I had already negotiated a whole ninety thousand dollar salary for her. Mm. work from home she was like just tell them before she just tell them nothing right so her money was no longer good here no longer good here F, indefinitely she can't buy a hoodie <laughs> you know what I'm saying <laughs> cannot buy a hoodie but I've right. done that in other spaces too where I've taken people that I've met <laughs> professionally that's like oh I own 150,000 trucks and I could do I got enough equipment and volume that I could take all the capacity around all the ports in the United States <laughs> right and I'm like oh let me introduce you to blah 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 and blah 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 blah, blah. and then the, guess what they blow the deal because they can't even talk the talk Right. So you get in this space and you're talking like breaking one nine. <laughs> yeah. It's yeah, like, yeah. you, let me be clear about that. I don't speak like an attorney because I'm not an attorney. I do not speak like a truck driver because I'm not a truck driver. I don't speak like an arborist because I'm not. Right. So when you go into spaces with other experts, I promise you, if you're lacking the dialogue and the terminology to make a connection, the door will close rather quickly because people get very short with their attention span when they feel like they have to educate you to do business with you. Mm. I do not even let my students start talking about how to execute anything until they understand how to have dialogue with me. So I meet you where you are on the first day, but we never coming back there. I'm going to meet you where you are today, but you're going to have to find me later. So I might say taxes to you today, but I'm saying duty and tariff after that. I may say bunker fuel adjustment to you, but I'm saying bath after that. Because even for a child... The children that have the best vocabulary are because mom and dad don't Google gag at him. Right. And I'm not about to Google and gag at anyone and then flip it and call them a scholar in any capacity. So, yeah, protect your network. If, I mean, protect it with your life for real because I can make phone calls and make things happen that will take somebody else maybe three to five years, but it took me 21 years to build that relationship. It took me all this education. It took me all these jobs. I worked a lot of jobs. Yeah. Right? And please don't knock jobs. People keep, I, this is a new thing. Everybody's knocking a job. I'm not saying you got to knock, you got to knock it for your whole life, but everybody's not entrepreneurship material. Right. right? You know, I was telling you on our own private time, like, I never even thought about there would be a time where I couldn't pay myself and I had to pay my staff or I had to pay my staff out of my personal account. Like, whoa, how I'm pulling that off. But that'll separate who's in it for the short term and who's in it for the long term, I think, right? Yeah. And then we don't generally have other entrepreneurs that we can ask stuff to. So we find ourselves learning the hard way, 
But uh, Ag- Alec- Alec- Agate has done very well, even though we have had those experiences still. Truck and Hustle family, I'm coming to you with an exclusive deal just for you. Call 800-991-6251 to get 10% off on your first purchase. Got it. So um, basically just kind of hearing you, you're saying like relationships are key, obviously, Correct. and yet you're making those introductions and, you know, via Agate, uh, Agate Solutions, when you become a scholar, you're going to make those introductions. But how important is actual capability, right? Because you can make introductions, you can introduce somebody into a network, but is there, because you said size don't necessarily matter, mm-hmm. right? So when you're, you know, bringing somebody direct to the plug, Right. How important is what they've done in their past performance and all that? Or is it just more so, hey, listen, um, I'm going to make this intro. And then like, how, how does that work? Just kind of well, so go it's, through it's that. pretty simplistic for me now because my students can't graduate my program until they actually do what I'm teaching. OK, so if you say to me, I, I want to learn Dreage and you're in my mentoring program, you're not going to be done with that until you actually perform that task. Okay. So my students don't come out and lack readiness. Mm. They come out job ready. They come out career ready. So I'm really proud, and I won't say anyone's names, but I'm really proud. At, like I have my top five students that have hit their first seven figures. And I'm so proud of that because these are people that were already doing very well. Their company was making more than my company when I met them. They were in business way longer than me. Right. And they were doing well domestically. They just didn't understand how to add global services. And we had to really take a long time and understand what their transferable skills were. What do you already have that we could flip into something better? So back to your question, you know, you want to make sure that you just don't directly give somebody the plug, right? Because are they capable? How I know they're capable is because I'm not making that connection until I see you do it. Makes sense. Talk about some of those transferable skills because that's that's important, right? Like talk about a use case. You don't got to name any names, but where somebody is able to take something that they already do or that they already do and they're able to transfer it into, you know, global, the global logistics space. So I'll, I'll give you two examples. So the first one is a woman came to me and she took every class I had. She's an introvert. She never really talked at all. I didn't even know she existed. And then she said, I wanted to talk to you one on one. And she booked time with me. And it's like, you took all these classes and I never even met you. You've been here for six months, right? I never even met her. She was just that quiet. Yeah. And she had, I think, about six trucks at the time. And, you know, I, I'm not an expert in trucking, but I know how to take a trucking company to a global platform. And she was like, you know, all my drivers are doing OTR. And she was talking about fuel. And she was educating me. On the truck side, she was like, you know, rates had gotten so low that they were like less than $2 a mile. And I'm like, what does that mean? She was like, no, literally, like exactly how I'm explaining to you. Less than $2 would be made per mile. And she started explaining to me the math behind what that means in fuel and cost for operations to run the truck and what the driver got to make. And I was like, oh, my God, you like an upside down mortgage. Right, right. I didn't know. I didn't know. Right. I was like, oh, my God, that's a bad mortgage. And she was like, yeah. So I said, well, okay. Let's start assessing the drivers, right? None of the drivers were hazmat certified. None of them were prepared to go into the port. So I was like, okay, why are y'all not hazmat certified? She's like, my drivers are afraid to actually move hazardous material. So I said, okay, so let's start certifying the freight. You never have to touch it ever. She was like, how? And so I was like, there's a shipper's declaration. There's a hazardous declaration. There's bill of lading. Somebody, who's going to put the placket on the truck? Somebody has to physically do that, but there has to be an expert to tell them what placards go on the truck? Mm. What labels go on the actual boxes? Who signs the hazardous document? Stop thinking you got to drive it. You don't want to touch hazmat, don't touch it, but you better certify it. That's a, <laughs> that's a bag, right? right? So she was like, okay. So she, she said, I never took your hazmat course. She did that. Then once they were educated on hazmat, two of the drivers were like, oh, I didn't know it wasn't, I didn't know there were certain has classes that were less dangerous than other has classes. Right. They, like a 5.1 oxidizer will not be able to be put out. Seriously. Like you can't just go throw some water on an oxidizer. And to give you an example of that, a bleaching agent, like you have chlorine in your house, a bleach in your house, that's calcium hypochlorite. That's a 5.1 oxidizer. So don't leave it in your house past shelf life, throw it away. But anyway, <laughs> my point is that 
you might not want to drive that, but you might feel okay with flammable liquid. Right? So you have to understand what you move. You don't, have, all in one you don't have to move at all. Right. You don't have to move at all. So right. they added that to the services, okay? Then the drivers were upset because they never were seeing their families. Sometimes they had their wives or spouses driving with them or the kids, their dogs. Like you living in this truck. Like I, I didn't even know they had beds and stuff. That's how far removed, right? Mm. So I'm like, okay, so let's start getting people prepared for drayage. So we took another few of those drivers and start getting them qualified to go into the port. But I don't just mean, because people are like, oh, I'm going to get a Twit card and I'm going to roll up. No. I mean, like, let's make sure that you're joining the right associations at the port where you know the port director. You understand the customs officers. You know the freight forwarders. You know the NVOCCs. And once you start to know that, that's your network. They calling you all the time. Like, can you take this? Can you take this? Before you know it, it's a three to five year contract. Like, if you're going to do the freight, do a bid. Mm. Right. So she was like, that started happening so rapidly. And so I was like, well, y'all work on that. Right. Here's the blueprint. Y'all just go work on that. And in the background, I was like, man, she would be dope for a warehouse. So I was like, you interested in warehousing? She was like, I, I have a small warehouse. And I was like, okay. So she was like, but it's really, really, really small. So people bite off more than they can chew, right? People are like, oh, I need a 5,000 square foot house. No, you need a, tw a 12 square foot apartment first. <laughs> Everybody not ready. You don't even want to cut the grass, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah, You're not yeah, ready. Yeah. So we had a very small square footage, very, very small. So I said to her, don't take more than that because I knew what her overhead was. I was like, no, no, no. You're not going to be able to afford all that with all the new changes we're making in your business model because we're spending too much on getting all these drivers in these Certified specialty spaces, that, right? right? So let's not spend for that. So while she was focused on that, I started preparing a plan for her to now turn her warehouse into a farm and trade zone and when it was time to renew her lease, make sure that her lease was negotiated that she can add on more square footage without renegotiating the rate. Mm. That makes sense? Yeah. So if I'm going to live in your apartment, I want a two-year lease so I can get the same rate if I can. For sure. Instead of every year, I'm back in your face like, don't add 3%. Don't right. add five percent. Right. So we reneg and they they were fine with that. We didn't even have an issue. They, they liked her as a tenant. Why are you trying to buy the building? I'm not saying there's anything wrong with that. If your capital say you could go buy the building, bowl out. That's not everybody's situation. And you need to, to, in my opinion, what I've learned is expanding when the need is there, when there's a customer there, makes more sense. So while they were doing all that, I was already preparing a step-by-step -step process to now take this building and turn it into a farm and trade zone. People that don't know what a farm and trade zone is uh, without going too deep, it's a warehouse, but it's different than your standard warehouse. So a farm and trade zone is literally designated by customs, which is in a parent-child relationship, the child to Homeland Security or Department of Homeland Security. Mm. So you work with customs to certify that particular infrastructure so that way the building is physically on U.S. soil, but it's considered on foreign soil to do business in that entity. So let me give you a better example. You see a warehouse, you don't know what it is. Sometimes you're driving down the street and it says approaching foreign trade zone. People don't know what that is. That means that U.S. Customs has said that even though this building is physically here, it is on foreign soil. So when products are imported and exported out of the United States, they can go into a foreign trade zone and be duty free, meaning no tax. Mm. For a certain amount of time. You can manufacture in a foreign trade zone. You can assemble. You can do chemical calibration. You can't do that in a domestic warehouse. So now back to shippers. You're not targeting shippers no more. You want importers and exporters because they care about duty recovery. They care about duty savings. They don't care about a mile. Who cares about a mile? Mm. As long as you're busy negotiating a mile, you're forgetting the commodity and you're forgetting all the bigger things you could do. It's, it's becoming busy work, blah, 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 busy work, busy work. You can't think now. And what was so great about working with this person was even though she was already an expert in domestic logistics, she didn't, she didn't try to over talk it. She didn't try to overthink it. She said, tell me what to do and I'm going to do it. And for a whole year, she did. So they decided to decrease their trucks because why, right? That's not what we're trying to do here. If you're thinking about a global footprint, we're talking about air. We're talking about ocean. So 
we wanted to start preparing her for that. So she reduced the trucks that she has. I think she got like three, maybe four. They do all port moves now. They don't do any OTR. So now the driver's are home for dinner. We all happy about that. The building is now a farm and trade zone instead of a domestic warehouse. It was only like 950 square feet. And now it's like 3,500. Mm. So that makes sense for her. So I was like, it's time for you to be a freight forwarder. I think it's time for you to be a freight forwarder. I don't want to tell you your goals, but if it was me, <laughs> if it was me. That's what I'd do. That's what I'd do, <laughs> right, right? Right, right? So she was like, okay, so what does that look like, right? So now it's, do you want to be an air freight forwarder? Do you want to be an ocean freight forwarder? Do you want to be both? Because now you qualify to do both. So she's like, let's do it, right? So we made her a freight forwarder. So what happens now? Why is she chasing freight? She's getting freight from origin. Let me tell you how that works. All right, so let's play this game real Break quick. Break it down, yeah. Okay. All right, you ready? I'm ready. All right. So you Home Depot. Okay. Home Depot, call Shaq. So call me real quick. <clears throat> uh, Agate Solutions, how may I help you? Hey, this is Bill from Home Depot. <laughs> What's good, Bill? This is Shaq. How may I help you? Uh, I'm here at Home Depot. and want to uh, move some freight? I, I want to move some freight, Shaq. All right. So you just got this call from Home Depot. He want to move a 1,000 lawnmowers. He want to move them all from China. I'm like, all right, cool. All I need from you is to give me the name and number for your manufacturer overseas. I'm calling overseas. Hey, manufacturer in China, I'm a representative of freight forwarder for Home Depot. So my understanding, they want to bring in a thousand lawnmowers and they need them all here within the next 45 days. I need to understand your production schedule. How many lawnmowers can you produce in two days, three days, four days, a week? Camera, please look at me. Mm. That is supply chain. Mm. When you understand supply chain, you understand that the originating point is the manufacturing and the foreign sourcing of good. That's where it's going to start. That's supply chain. Not you going to the port. That's just a small entity of that. You're a chain in that, but you're not the whole supply chain. So immediately she's a freight forwarder. I mean, I'm saying immediately, but we went through all the paperwork. And now, of course, I've been working with her for a year. She can have access to my network. She can travel with me. She can meet everybody now. She part of the Agate team. I consider her to be like a partner now at this point because I'm going to have people come store their freight there. She's another arm is how I look at her. She's an arm to the infrastructure of what Agate is building because we coming for the whole global supply chain. Every student is qualified to either do a port move, a rail move, a foreign domestic move. They're prepared to manufacture, source, quality and spec, Customs clear, air freight, o ocean freight, international trade. So at the end of the day, there is n nothing that Agate scholars can't do. They're becoming the next line of the secession plan. Mm. And that's really impact, for real. Mm. That's really what impact looked like. So now she's a freight forwarder, just wow. like that. Wow. You said you had two, because that was a dope So the story. other need, one, other one is other. quicker. So the other okay. one... She was doing OTR, but she was very close to a very viable ocean port. So I don't know if you're familiar. You remember not too long ago, maybe it was less than a year ago, everybody's going crazy about the evergreen vessel that was stuck in the Suez Canal. Of course. Yeah. All right. So let's take that further back. If you're really a supply chain expert and you're watching this, you should be able to rock with me heavy right now. So many, many moons ago, that used to happen in the Panama Canal. So the Panama Canal, so people also, listen, when you think logistics and you don't know geography, we have a whole nother problem. <laughs> the same way you understand, don't take 95, don't take 285, that's a trade lane. Would you agree that's a trade lane? Yeah, I would. Or when you're going up 80 or wherever trucks are going and you know that's the best way to get there, that's a domestic trade lane. The same thing happened in ocean and the same thing happens on the air. The same way trucking companies or say, hey, I'm going to get the freight to Charlotte and you got to take it the next leg. The same thing is happening in ocean freight and air freight. Logistically, I understand that. I know what vessels are co-partnering to vessel share. They're vessel sharing equipment. So let's say I want to get something out of China. But I know I got to get here in 45 days, right? That's almost impossible these days. It used to be possible. Right. But it's my job to understand. Let's go. Costco is the largest steamship line out of China. It's owned by the Chinese government, right? I have to know that. Why? Because I'm, I'm a global logistics expert. But what makes me different from everybody else is I am going to understand who Costco vessel shares with. 
So Costco might be able to get to Taiwan. I'm just making up days. Maybe if it get to Taiwan in two days. I don't have time for that. So I need, I'm going to tell you, get my cargo to Taiwan. I'm already working with a whole different steamship line at Vessel Share to get that equipment, that all those containers on this new container to make it to whatever port I need it here in time. And if I have to do that again in Germany, again in the Philippines, and again and again and again, I'm going to still beat everybody else. That's logistics. Mm. Logistics is not just the movement of goods. It's the geographic understanding of how to make strategic decisions to beat everybody else. Mm. Otherwise, you work it outside the industry. That's so corny. <laughs> right? Like, if you're going to do this, do it. Right? right. So... Back to the Phil- that back to the Panama Canal, right? So the Panama Canal vessels getting stuck. It wasn't big enough, but we all know that China is like the largest manufacturer of goods, especially like aluminum and steel. So we need that stuff to get on vessels. It can't go air freight, right? We need to go barge. It needs to come through the Panama Canal. So there was an international effort to expand the Panama Canal so that the largest vessels can come through that canal. So they wouldn't be stuck like the Suez Canal, right? right? right. What does that mean for the United States? Y'all got to up the ante. Because if I'm going to bring all these larger ships, where are they going? Mm. Savannah couldn't take them. Guess why? Because it needed to be dredged where the actual, I hate to say it, but literally sand to water couldn't hold a large ship. They had to dredge and dredge and dredge so that those ships wouldn't be stuck and the water would be high enough to take it. What did that mean for Charleston? Anybody that live in Charleston right now, you should see heavy construction because the port is expanding so massively because all these vessels are coming. Remember, although we are competing internationally, we're still competing domestically. Savannah wants that freight to come here so that that import duty and domestic duty and everything that's going to come, that freight is going to come through here because that's more money for what? The Georgia economy, Mm. right? New York want that freight to come to them because that's more work for the the truck drivers, the drayage, warehousing in the Northeast. So now they're competing on the waterways for freight. The same way y'all are here competing for the trucking freight. It's the competition is at every level. You just got to know how to master each level to win it all. And if you keep thinking that logistics is just my truck from California tag team to New York, I'm telling you, that is really the bottom of the barrel. You can have that all day, Mm. all day. And and no disrespect to anybody, but I often hear, you know, how forgiving the industry is. Oh, yeah, you can have 15 felonies. You you could be knuck if you buck and still be a multi-millionaire in trucking. <laughs> and I'm not going to say that's not true, right? Yeah. That's not my area of specialty. Right. I enjoy the fact that there is some industry that's forgiven because there needs to be a second chance, third chance, and fourth chance. I've had many in my life. What I am saying, though, is just because that looks like the easy lane because you've made some mistakes in your life doesn't mean that's where you stop. There's no regulation that say you can't still do global logistics. There's a second and third chance in global logistics, too. It's not Mm -hmm. so forgiving in international trade, though. But in global logistics, it is. So the example I was making was, okay, I'm telling the other student, you live next to one of the largest ports that's expanding because of the Panama Canal. How you not eating? You can look at the port from your living room. Like, port? I didn't think about that. All right. So for her, it was pretty simplistic. She just changed her total operations to all things drayage, all things freight forwarders. And of course, she's in the inner circle. So freight comes to her. She's never used a low board again either. And she hit her first seven figures. And I'm extremely proud of her. Wow. Wow. That's amazing, man. You got so much in your head, man. It's crazy. Uh Um, What is going on right now in 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 global logistics and international trade that's going to affect us the most? here domestically so use your crystal ball real quick so on the global logistics side we're still seeing a slow supply chain and a lot of that i just expect to hear i expect to see stay uh free days at the port are no longer what they used to be where you can get maybe seven to nine days that probably will never come back again uh ports are still shutting down for various reasons for manufacturing sites and things like that and government 
issues, period, in other countries. So I don't expect people to, to see the ease and the supply chain for what we used to know back before COVID. I think that people have to get more strategic in understanding what commodities come from what regions of the world and where do they enter into the United States in order to really capitalize on that if you want to continue to be successful as a domestic logistics provider, period. Mm. On the international tra- trade side, that shifts heavily based on who is in office. Our administration, from a federal perspective, shifts that. Uh, I've been heavily involved in a lot of trade missions globally through my National Black Chamber appointment as the vice chairwoman. And I think that in order for other nations to be able to compete, they have to be able to be able to understand the raw material, the classification of those material. The strategic plan for other nations to compete against each other and win is who can actually mass produce the quickest, the best quality product, but also who can have the trade agreements with the other nations that they can flood that market in. Because if you can get a trade agreement in, I'm just making up anything, in Pakistan for all these freight fest pillows, then you're going to flood that market. But you might not be as successful in Kenya. So from an international trade perspective, there's a lot happening. Uh, I think that all of us are very much aware of where you know we're seeing wars right we're very much aware but people don't know what a trade war is they don't get that trade war is as severe as a physical war to some extent although lives may not be in jeopardy people livelihoods are in jeopardy and depending on who you're talking to it can be more severe because when people lives are in jeopardy from an economic perspective they feel like their life itself it's a life or death situation for them at that point. So if you want to take that to a higher level, people need to understand what that looks like from economy to economy, from nation to nation, how that impacts the GDP. So from international trade, that's always going to shift based on who is in office. Right now, you know, we're seeing what's going on with Russia. Uh, people, people don't always understand what's happening to other countries. And I guess I get that because we want to know what's happening in our own backyard first. But when people was all stressing out about trying to find Lysol and paper towel and all that, we was chilling because I was already paying attention to what was happening in the other countries. People was dying in China months before we went on shutdown. Mm. So I encourage anyone that's watching this to be more savvy in the economies that you support because you could be supporting trade wars you don't even know about. Or you could be supporting child labor, forced labor for countries that you're not even paying attention to. I pay attention to the labels. I want to know who I'm supporting. Yeah. I think that also from a consumer perspective, I think that people need to be more aware about where they spend their dollar. It it truly matters. It really does. It truly matters. You need to know what you're supporting, what economy you're supporting. So a lot of things are changing. Uh, People that are interested in knowing how to be sustainable in this industry need to get out of their comfort zone, that space of this is what works because what you thought was working is a flop now. (laughs) It really is. It really is a flop. And and I'm saying it's a flop. That I'm not saying it's never going to come back. I just keep saying, I say that to say, stop staying in markets where you think that you can determine this future. If you really think you can determine everything that's going to happen with trucking. But if you was determining that based on what's happening in other countries or what's happening with air freight and ocean freight, you have a better chance. You asked me about skill sets and how they could be interchangeable. People often start fresh for something. And that's cool if you can. But people that watch this are dispatchers, right? You have a lot of dispatchers that watch this. People that are dispatchers are so resilient. They are problem solvers. They can take something and flip it and, and quickly. So why you can't do that for air freight and ocean freight? Why you can't book ocean freight? Why you got to just deal with truck drivers and that? And why? Right. Why you can't do that, right? People that are brokers, domestic brokers, or people that are domestic freight agents, they'll probably be great in VOCCs if they qualify or air freight forwarders or ocean freight forwarders because they understand the lanes in which they're brokering. You just need to understand the lanes globally now. Pick a lane that you're good at. It could be one region of the world. You don't have to understand it all. So I just, and people that are owning trucking companies, I think that they could do great. In the same way of the examples that the two women I just gave you, I just don't think they know how. And it sounds hard. People think, and people let syllables scare them. 
international that sounds like ooh. like i'd be like we ain't scared of that it's not if you understand people do back office for trucking i've been meeting a lot of people that do back office they're compliance geniuses you right. ever meet you know i'm sure you do 100 percent. i don't right i'm meeting them now though and i'm like oh wow you do all of that for the back office of a trucking company you know what you could do for an airline a cargo airline mm. or you know what you can do for uh an ocean carrier they don't even know. If you are great at compliance and in, interpreting regulatory and turning that into day-to-day -day operations, you could do that for anything. Nick, what is Fleet Drive 360? It's hard to put that into one sentence. The compliance process is so complex. So what Fleet Drive 360 does is it makes it simple. It gives you a process and a foundation that you can build on and allows you to hire your drivers, onboard them quickly, maintain their compliance documents throughout the life of that driver or that vehicle. And it gives you one place to go when things get crazy, one place to go to find out the compliance status of your entire business. What it is, is that one-stop shop for all your compliance needs. Yeah, yeah. What's a nation that we should watch? You talked about not just knowing about what's going on in America. If you were to suggest like somebody to pay attention to the way this country does things, if you had to pick one, because it's hard to just, you know, kind of go around the globe. Who would you say like operates well in, in like the, the game of chess that is global logistics and international trade or international trade, really? So India is doing a great job in tech. And people don't think that that matters, but international trade and global logistics also include service. It's not just the movement of goods. It's also intellectual property and services. Mm. So when I give my expertise to other nations, that's an export. So let's not discount India. Don't sleep on India for tech. That's one. Despite what's going on in the Chinese trade war, China is what it is, and it's a powerful economy, especially when we talk about manufacturing, period. And they really have mastered the export of that those manufactured goods through other regions. I mean, we just have to call it what it is. Logistically, they're doing it. Uh, I can't ignore what's happening in Africa. Africa has signed a agreement to have a free trade agreement that's intercontinental. So... The, con the countries within the continent are, some of them are trading goods for free within the own continent. That's powerful. To see Africa unite. It's big. Like I had to pause, digest that. Because <laughs> you got to digest that. Yeah. That's massive. Yeah. Right? That's massive. And then Antwerp. Antwerp. You have the port of Antwerp, which is in Belgium. I, I, I don't even know where the hell Antwerp is. I'm glad you said it. Was really? It? Nah, I never heard of that. That's a major port. It's in Belgium? <laughs> in Belgium. Okay. You <laughs> always make me feel smart. <laughs> and you always make me feel dumb. <laughs> <laughs> you heard of Antwerp before? Yeah, I heard it. Oh, you lying. I, I ain't going for it. So have you heard of Copenhagen? Yeah, I've heard of Copenhagen. Okay. So uh, Copenhagen, it, from a dangerous goods perspective, which is... Ha Similar to hazardous material. Yeah. You know what Maersk is, right? Yes. So Maersk is the largest steamship line in yeah. the world. Yeah. They're the trendsetter. Their with dangerous Maersk. good headquarters is in Copenhagen. Okay. So being a dangerous goods expert, I would need to know that, right? So For from sure. a dangerous goods, hazardous chemical perspective, Copenhagen is killing it. They're the master of all things. They are trendsetters. People are following their suit. Antwerp is doing well just out of the port itself. I've just seen them do things that I've never known other ports to do. Uh, domestically, though, people were sleeping on the rail. You ever heard of blocking and bracing? You know what that is? Blocking and bracing? Yeah, no. you know what tie guard is? So, uh, Educate me, Shaq, please. <laughs> I'm going to say this fast. <laughs> so uh, you've been, you probably been watching. Like, you can't ignore what's happening on the rail, right? Because we having derailments. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We see a trains hit trucks. Ohio and all that craziness, yeah. I'm not going to go into the Ohio because you're going to be like, Shaq, uh, you got some something for Ohio? I'm just saying. So I had did a little something on Instagram about Ohio and I could have went on and on and on. But yeah. so I talked about reportable quantity. It's called RQ. So inside of the regulations, it has something called, and I say regulations, I mean dangerous goods regulations. It's something called RQ. It's called reportable quantity. There could be a chemical spill 
right outside this window right now. And we'll never know about it if it's not over a certain number. And that's determined by what type of chemical it is. Mm. So this chemical spills probably all the time on the rail, on a truck, on 285, wherever. If it's not over a certain reportable quantity, we'll never know about it. Does that mean that it's not harmful? Hmm. <laughs> Somebody else has the power to determine what we should be aware of. Yeah. Now, for what happened in Ohio, it's too massive. Of course, the reportable quantity has to be publicized because look how much product that is. Right. So I remember many years ago when I first started working in dangerous goods and chemicals, I remember getting a, a phone call because people were turning blue in their pools. And it was like, I was new to this and I didn't know what that meant, right? I didn't know what that, I was new, but what does that mean? It it was anti-shocking agents that go into the chlorine and if it's overshocked, literally, it could be dangerous to your skin. How do you report that if it's in your home, right? right? So that's another story. But my, my point is pay attention to the things that don't really feel like, well, I'm not coughing. I'm not sneezing. There's an RQ, and what's ha- and that RQ is also by atmosphere. So how far does that impact go? Does it go outside of Ohio? Maybe. People should be aware of the bordering cities of what's happening. Right. And not be like even with Flint, people just seem so far removed sometimes. Of that's not here. You don't know that. Because they don't understand what reportable quantity or they don't understand dangerous goods. And people are just so, you know, we typically get in a bubble. Like, well, I got paper towel, tissue, and light, so I'm straight. Not really. Right. What that mean for three months from now, two months from now, people don't think long term. Everybody's on survival mode for the day. And when you get so preoccupied in your mind to be only thinking about the day, you're not prepared for tomorrow and the next day. And that's where a lot of times with domestic logistics uh, providers suffer. Because they only like, I'm going to get this rate today. And it looked like $10 a mile. And they're not really understanding that. And a month from now, 50 million avocados is going to come from South America through Florida. And you sitting at the Georgia port like, it's slow. <laughs> Florida's <laughs> only right there. Go run up on Florida real quick. right? right? And, and I'm saying that like it's simplistic. I, I know it's not as simplistic as I say it. But I'm just saying it's a strategic method for that. I understand what reads of the world raw produce. What what seasons those products are gonna move in? I understand, and this is all public information. Let me tell you one more thing before we wrap up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Every time something is imported into the United States, it has to be classified. Classification is also determined or defined as harmonized tariff schedule. So the word duty and tariff is often interchangeable. It's like taxes, right? So every time something is imported. It has to be classified. Everything, these pillows, this microphone, everything, this hoodie has to be classified. The most expensive things to classify, meaning the duty rate, is footwear and apparel. Generally, something could be 32% just to import it. So let me put that in perspective. We got on these hoodies. We can bring in a million of these hoodies on two containers, two 20-foot containers. I'm just making up a scenario. Both of those containers are, are valued at, let's say, $100,000. We have to pay 32% duty to customs to get it into this country. A lot of times that's still cheaper than domestically sourcing a product. So people still do it, right? Makes sense. Mm-hmm. However, people don't understand how to classify goods. So there is a universal number with most NATO countries. And I'm saying NATO for simplicity, for simplicity. But really what I mean is WTO countries, World Trade Organization. They're all partnering. All these countries have come together and partnered. And they say, hey, let's come up with this system to classify all of these goods and determine what the duty is between your country, your country, your country, your country. That's a high demand skill to know how to classify these products. And guess what else? Every digit of that number represents something. The first two digits represent the commodity and so forth and so forth. So let's say the first two digits is zero one. That might be milk. Let's say it's 34. That might be chemicals. Let's say it's 64. That might be hoodies, right? But every digit also represents the country of origin. So every one of those digits has to be reported to the Department of Census. 
because for statistical information. So all of that's public information. Mm -hmm. If you understood how to classify a product and what every digit represents, one, if you was looking for a job, look no more. People worried about AI and outsourcing. International trade regulations require a whole person, a whole Shaquana, to be an expert to an importer and an export. You can't outsource that. A regulation won't even allow it. So while people are stressing about all these jobs are going to robots and talking robotic dogs and other countries, you need to up your skill for something that takes some brain juice. <laughs> and that's what, and no, and then you're not fighting for a remote job. They gladly giving it to you. That's how right. many people you don't know how to classify a product into the country? One. Boom. <laughs> I know about 400. I'm joking. I'm joking. But my point is, is it's a skill. It's a high demand skill. Yeah. And then I'm not saying truck drivers has to know all of that, but if they at least understood how to read the data from the International Trade Administration, then they would be like, oh, you can see clearly what those codes mean for what's coming in around the world. History repeats itself, right? That's right. So if you saw that furniture, clothing, and pillows all came from the New York port from January to June every year for the last five years. And you know that that's something that you can haul. I think I might want to station myself there during those months. And I mean, some people are just not as strategic. But if you're going to call yourself a logistics surprise, you have to do logistics. Logistics is not just the movement of the good. It's also the geography of making it move faster, making it move smoother, making it move safer, with more automation. And when you do that, then you are excelling at logistics. Anything outside of that is the outer skirts of the industry. And you're really not in it to win it. You're just making some money for now. But when you think about people that's in this, like the C.H. Robinsons and the expediters, they... They deep in this. Yeah. So if anybody wanted any advice from me, I, ju I just want to employ you to get a better understanding of what's happening from a global perspective. Because the freight forwarders and the NVOCCs that have a global fo footprint, um, they're shifting even. I'll tell you, oh, don't go to Florida. Go to New York. They're doing the same thing for nations. Like, you know what? China has got all of this going on. We're going to start moving the freight from Taiwan and the Philippines. They're shifting their... Same cargo. They ship this down, shifting their containers, moving their equipment. The same thing that you guys are already doing domestically. It's not as different as they think. Mm. They just haven't taken the time to really tap into that. That's real. Man, every time I talk to you, man, my, my brain is doing backflips and somersaults. So I don't I, I gotta watch this one back. I gotta watch I might watch this act this episode. We talking about we don't watch our episode. We got to watch I might have to one. watch this one so I can learn something, man. You got you got five hundred plus students now. How many more students you taking on, Shaq? What 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 are we what are we doing here? All right, so I haven't even told anybody this yet. So I'm gonna say it here. Okay. So I have totally revamped my intensive course and it's not what it was so i have not taught it all this year mm. and people keep asking me where's the intensive and i haven't taken any new students for it and it's impacted my bottom line so i want to say this to anyone that's listening that's entrepreneurs uh people say this all the time and i didn't get it before like don't rush the process i've been trying to rush this and rush it. like you messed up my money man <laughs> uh but guess what it, it it's, it's, it's as close to perfection as I could have ever imagined. I'm so proud of it. And um, nobody's seen it yet. Mm. So I'm going to let a couple of my Aggie scholars that's in my executive leadership team watch it um, just because, you know, get their feedback. But so we're going to be launching it soon. And this is totally different because before it still has everything it taught you before. So it teaches you sourcing, how to source products from other countries, imports, exports. It's teaching you all those things. But now, in addition to that, it teaches you how to be a freight forwarder. Uh, I'm qualified to certify a freight forwarder if I thought that you were prepared for that. So I can write the recommendation and certify you if I felt like you had that level of skill. And I believe that you can actually perform in that capacity ethically and in skill. Mm. So I'm teaching you how to be a freight forwarder. I am now teaching how to get freight from Canada and Mexico. And I'm teaching people how to get CT pass certified. Mm. So people often lose bids because they don't know what CTPAT is. Uh, everybody should not be CTPAT certified, but the people that should be CTPAT certified are people that are looking to do business with large importers, exporters, and move freight for government agencies. Uh, it's a 
require it's not a requirement. That's what people don't do it. People, if somebody said to you, you're required to get your degree, you're gonna go get it. Facts. But if I say it's not required, but if you want to get your GED, you might rock with your GED because it sounds so simplistic, right? No it doubt. sounds so easy. So CTPAT actually stands for Customs Partnership Against Terrorism. So after 9-11, US Customs said we gotta do a better job of protecting our borders. Every border, every border, land border, sea border, air border, every border. How are we going to do that? We need a partnership with importers and exporters and trucking companies and freight forwarders that says, tell me all your business. What's in your cargo van? What's in your container? How are you securing your freight? Where are your cameras? Are you moving stuff safely? You know how you hear people always like, oh my God, they got all this cocaine was seized at the port. <laughs> right, right. CT Pat is all over that and it's reported. So what I tell people is it makes sense for some people to be CT Pat certified. Why? Because now when you bid on those bigger contracts for like Home Depot or Walmart or maybe even Lockheed Martin, now you're in a position to win because you are saying I partner with you to disclose to customs any type of issue that we may have. And if even if we don't have an issue, I'm going to disclose everything I'm doing to secure our borders, even if I'm moving freight domestically, depending on what you do. So I, I've noticed that a lot of people were losing bids, even students I had. And I'm like, why y'all not certified? And they're like, oh, it's, that's voluntary. I'm like, Marriage is voluntary, <laughs> but I, you know what I'm saying? But I love, but you, you need a spouse. Right. I mean, I, I believe that. But anyway, right, 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 so right. I'm teaching how to get CT Pat certified now, how to become a freight forwarder, and how to move freight from Canada and Mexico. Mm. So I've never done that before. So we'll be launching that soon. And I look forward to seeing what people can do with that. And we're launching a hybrid. So people always say, I want to have this course for months. And I'm like, we don't do that over here. But I was like, you know what? I can't deny people that actually need more time to absorb and digest what I'm teaching because it's massive. I think that sometimes I was forgetting how big it is for somebody to be like, wait a minute, I need to watch that four more times. Yeah, People might need to. So we've extended that where you can watch it for way longer. But then I get to meet with you and start breaking that down on what it is for your company or some maybe you don't want a company. We have people that have flipped the script when it comes to their career opportunities and now their professional development is on a whole nother level. So I had to make sure that I was preparing Aggie scholars to win both in an academic space and a professional development and an entrepreneurship side. And people, you can start businesses every day. If you're not listening to what your customer wants, if you are not listening to what your customer wants, that's a bigger problem. I told my mail if he sell another truck and hustle hoodie <laughs> and it did not have a drawstring, I was going to roll up on him. Do you see this hoodie? <laughs> you know I was saying? like, we you from feel, a cold state. You feel me? <laughs> we from a cold state. That's right. And I would never buy a hoodie that didn't have drawstrings <laughs> because if I'm walking and it's on my head and I need to do this to protect my ears. You need to grip up. It don't grip up. <laughs> <laughs> you better not sell no northern uh, no hoodie that don't grip up. What did he do? Yo, right, right away, right? Right. My Look students back. was like, Shaq, we need more time to watch this. Shaq, we need some people that have professional development needs. So before I knew it, it was like, okay, so I had to build a team to do resumes, LinkedIn profiles, coach you on jobs. Now we got a whole professional development division mm -hmm. just for that. Because everybody don't want to be an entrepreneur. Everybody ain't really built for that. Right. There's times where I'd be like, I don't know if I want to do that. <laughs> <laughs> but my point is that, you know, listening to your customer is important. And no, I didn't do some massive target, targeted type of survey or anything like that. I just said, everybody come to a live. And I just send it out everywhere. Yeah, And I just started asking them questions. I like, take yourself off mic. What about this? What y'all think about that? What am I doing wrong? What else you want from me? Blah, 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 blah. People ask for hoodies. I'm like, I don't do merch. Nah, we need a hoodie. <laughs> I was like, okay, I'm doing hoodies. I don't care about no hoodie. I like my truck and hustle hoodie. <laughs> no now question. we got hoodies and they, and they sell like crazy. And I'm wow, like, hoodies? Wow, but wow. my point is that when I came and when I started Agus Solutions, I had no idea that I was ever going to work with a trucking company, a dispatcher, or anyone that was in domestic logistics. I came into this and I said, I am going to work with career professionals that had the same hardships I had in my career. 
racism, sexism, blah, blah, blah. All the isms. All, all the isms, because I have dealt with the, all the isms. And mm. if you don't know all of them, a lot of them is in uh, episode 85. <laughs> no doubt. <laughs> all the isms. So I was like, I'm going to help everybody. They don't have to do that. That's the social work of heart. I'm going to help everybody. And that my business plan was built specific for that. And I had to not be so attached to my vision that I could forget that the whole real point of Agate was to be serving. The mission statement is to bring a solid solution to the complexities of international trade and global logistics. How I'm taking the edge off the stress if I'm not meeting people where they need to be met. That's right. So if you came out here to make shea butter... If you came out here and you said, I'm only doing box trucks, if your customer is saying, we need a warehouse, we need a farm and trade zone, we need hazmat, and you like, nah, son, you need an ag experience in your life. Mm. Because I'm telling you, when you do that, you missing sustainability, you missing a bigger bag, but you also missing a heart's purpose. So when I, I, I love... I never got it, but I love it now. People are like, oh, I'm not, don't rush my process. I, I used to be like, no, no, no. I need to get to this bag. I quit my six-figure job and I need my money now. Right. No, that's that hustle mentality. That's that grind mentality. And that's not operating in a place of peace. And that's never going to be peacefully paid. And I thank God that I had to be uh, humble enough to surrender what I thought was my creativity and take on something that I knew that God said, I, that's not what I have for you. You know, I tell y'all all the time, agate is a beautiful stone. And someone gave me this stone and was like, you remind me of this stone. It represents peace and cause. Oh, I'm going to build a business around that. It wasn't until agate was already popping with revenue that one day somebody said, oh, that's what you, that's why you named the company agate. And I said, yeah. She said, Agate is the fifth stone in the breastplate of Christ. I was like, what? She was like, yeah, look it up. I was like, the fifth? What's a breastplate? So I, I went on this hunt through the Bible. like, <laughs> right? And it really, and I mean, it's bookmarked in my Bible today because it meant so much to me that I, at that moment, I knew that I didn't think of this. That was not my own might. That was not me, the physical person, Shaquana Teasley, that came up with that. And the stone is blue, white with a gold trim. So that's my brand colors, right? Facts. Only to find out that that's exactly what was in the word. Mm. And I, I won't go through all that, but it's in Exodus. My it, point it is written. that it was, it was written. And I'm going to tell you right now, you hear people say all the time, build a plan, God will laugh. I'm so serious that's true because everything that I thought I was going to do went a totally different direction with Aggie. And you got to sur- humble, being humble and surrendering is not the same thing. Being humble is the ability to understand that you are still human and hu- having humility where you're never too big for your britches. That's my definition, right? My def, not Webster's. Surrendering is the ability to lay down what you think is your own might and skill and strength. All of it, like put it down on the floor and really be like, all right, God, what we doing today? That's a place of race, rest. And that really is where the peacefully paid come from. I'm grateful that I had somebody to guide me in that because that grind and that hustle, it was coming for me. Mm. No, I mean that. It was coming for me. 16 hour days, not seeing the kids, burned out. I mean, one day I was sitting on my step. My husband was like, why are you still sitting here? I'm like, I can't get up. He was like, what? I was like, I cannot get up. Then I had a moment of like, y'all, I'm not even enjoying the money I'm making. I was driving my 2004 Honda. Like, I'm buying what I need, not what I want. It's like, why? Why you can't have what you want? What's wrong with having what you want? (laughs) I had this mentality because, you know, sometimes we still working on trauma from our young days. Right. Me, I can speak for me. People don't even, sometimes people say, oh, black entrepreneurs fail after this. This many uh, black women businesses fail. Here's the ratio. Here's the metric. Here's the KPIs. I think a lot of times we fail because nobody gives us grace to heal from trauma for just being black. (laughs) Right. Right. And, you know, that goes with working on yourself, and I'm not a therapist, so I'm not going to go there. But my point is I had to do some self-work, for real, for real. And my, my I did not allow the, the pace to be sped up. 
And it did impact my bottom line, but I, I was humble and I was surrendering to whatever that was going to look like to get as close to perfect as what it is. And I'm so proud of the new course. Our course is also accredited now. It Dope. wasn't before. Dope. So we've been accredited by the National Customs Brokers Freight Forwarders Association on Capitol uh, Hill. Yeah, that's a that's big. That's big. We that's gotta, big. Gotta that's gotta big. Definitely clap so we up are that. officially accredited. Accredited. That's big. So we are officially, officially an educational institute. Mm. We are not popping off with a course. This is not a course. It's an educational institute. We support people that are in domestic logistics, global logistics, and international trade, both in career development and in entrepreneurship development to take their businesses global. And of course we do consulting. I'm really proud of what it is today. So we have over 500 students. Uh, out of that 500, I would say like 200 or close to like a high 100 stay with the program. Some people are just not uh, ready. But they can always come back as long as you know they make them interview appointments. <laughs> <laughs> no doubt. That's fair. That's right, fair. Right, right. A lot of them was at Freight Fest. I believe it. They, the, it was the, loud, the right? Agate Scholars came to Agate Scholars like, woo, woo, woo. Yeah, I, I love how y'all move, man. Everybody's in formation. Everybody's in unison and repping. They hard. are. They love to be Agate Scholars. They do. They do. My students, they, let me tell you, when they go somewhere... And I get us on the mic, and I be asking scholars in the building, like, woo, 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 woo. it make my heart smile because I know they're not doing that to be down. Right. They doing that because they can touch and feel something that's real. And sometimes it's dollars, sometimes it's work, sometimes it's knowledge, sometimes it's connections. And at the end of the day, Agus scholars find peace here because they know that they can trust who they're working with. They know that. No one on my team is going to let them down unless they leaving they self behind. I'm going to come for you at some point, but then you got to do the work. And that all falls back to accountability, and we all got to be accountable for something. Mm. We done? Yeah, I'm good. You know how we roll. I'm think, sorry if I, I, I went too I think, long. I think we done. I, I think, think we, we done, man. Hey, Listen, that, that, was, uh, that was quite a lot, man, to just to take in. So, um I, if you don't respect that, your whole perspective is <laughs> whack. whack. <laughs> Yo, Yo. Fest is here. Freight Fest. We going Freight to be Fest. at Freight Fest? I'm supposed to be out of the country, but I'm thinking to go for a day and fly that night. I'm still working on it. We got to make um, that happen. I, my students are already hitting me up. But I keep People think that I'm like somehow like threaded into Freight Fest. <laughs> Because you are, <laughs> maybe you because know, we, you are. We went hard with um, supporting it. Yeah, and, yeah, um, yeah. I mean, like we, we <laughs> you would have thought we was Thank a call you for center. That. Yeah, one hundred percent. You would have thought we was a call center. Um, because Freight Fest is important. Let me tell you, Freight Fest is kind of um, Freight Fest means a lot to me. Freight Fest means a lot to me because I have been going to TPM. You know what TPM is, mm -hmm. right? So I've gone to TPM. I've gone to just logistics, global logistics, not necessarily trucking, but more on the global side, industry trade side. And I never really felt embraced. I always felt like I'm the only Shaquana. And I'd be walking up on their lunch table. I'm like, somebody sitting here? And they like putting the laptop there. I'm like, oh, shit, they don't want me to sit right here. <laughs> like, wow. Well, then I ended up at the table at the bath by the bathroom. And, you know, I have a very outgoing personality, so I'm social. Like, this is me all the time, right? I'm not an introvert. We're going to talk. That's right. A lot, probably. <laughs> <laughs> so I have a hard time with uh, that type of rejection because I know I'm coming with so much purity, right? And when I saw, when, when, you know, we, we had talked about Freight Fest before, it really was. Yeah, yeah, right? yeah. You one of the first people I brought Freight Fest And I just too. randomly called you yeah, one day, yeah, like, how y'all doing? Like, Yo, this is what we doing. I need you there. And you're like, all right, cool. Talk so to I, me. I, if, if I say this and I jump the gun, I apologize in advance. But I felt like it was our thing. And it wasn't. Mm. But it wasn't our thing. But yeah. it, it felt like, oh, shit, you know what we doing? Because I think that I had dealt with a lot of rejection from conferences because of what I look like or because of what I sound like. Even the Northern thing be a thing for people. Like you sound so Brooklyn. I don't want, I don't know how to not sound like that. Right. <laughs> right. Or the Shaquana name or, you know, what I call my Shaka Khan here or whatever. <laughs> right. People has their isms and stuff. Right. And when Freight Fest came about, I felt like I got a thing. 
Like, that's my thing. Yeah. It, and I don't mean mine like I own it. I mean like a place where I'm invited. I'm an integral part of that. Where I can make an impact. Where I know people was going to leave there with something that nobody else could give them. Not because I'm the only person that's an expert in this, but I'm the only person that's an expert that can give it up how I give it. And right. I can know that. Like I, I know that. I, I know that. I know that when I get on a stage that you're going to walk away with a flutter in your stomach. Mm. You're going to feel a, a extra heartbeat that day. You're going to feel like I hugged you and all I did was stand on the stage. I know I have that impact on people. I didn't always, but I know now. I knew that after my first Truck and Hustle interview by all the feedback I got. Like, wow, I could really touch people like that. Like, in a good way. Yeah. Everybody don't use that power for good. <laughs> for sure. They don't. They'd be like, oh, you were hypnotized. It'd be a whole, you know, <laughs> it'd be a whole teacup. Yeah. But, so, Freight Fest meant that to me. And, um... It wasn't until Freight Fest was over that I really thought about that. Like, that's not mine. That that does not belong to me. Yes, I make an impact. Yes, I'm an integral part of it. Yes, I can give it up different than anybody else. Yes, I know that people walk away with a certain skill that nobody else can give them the way I could give it. But it reminded me also that you can't have ownership in somebody else's creativity just because you've experienced rejection in some other space. Mm. Like, I can't share your marriage because I never had one. But it's love over there. I'm going to just be all up over here with them because that feel like love. And right. I never had that. Right. Right? So I'm not saying I want to be in a conference space. That's not my thing. My point is that I've, I've really put an emotional attachment to Free Fest. Mm. Wow. I did. Wow. That's dope. Well, that's why you got to be there this year again to continue that emotional. If one more person hit me up about Freight Fest, <laughs> I'm telling you, like people are hitting Yo, me up about Freight Fest and they asking me questions like I'm the organizer. <laughs> like, you know, if they going to have food and beverages, you know what the room rate is. And I'm like, that's my fault because I went so hard. They looking at it like, yeah. oh, you know, you got to act Shaq. No, you don't act Shaq. Yeah. But but that's that's the love, though. You know, yeah. that's that's our bond, what we've created. And that's just a community just how it feels you know what i mean that's true yeah it's just it's just a community that is just different than anything else and you had to be there you, or you have to be there to really understand it so did you hear all the inside jokes later no what inside jokes like yo they better not never try to make me talk after shack again i didn't hear that oh, i yeah. didn't hear that it's a nah, real thing but i could imagine that's a thing because and i'm not you, saying you, that you, like i'm all that it I'm is a, a real I'm thing i'm gonna tell you what i mean you and, and there was I, I told you this before. You there did was, like the top, the, like yeah, y'all, yeah. y'all. I'm not even gonna name no names. Yeah, but we but know. I know. I know. We who, don't know. Yeah, I know who. I it know was who, a yeah. few people that came one after another that really like, boom, boom, lit the boom. room up, it was and the, everybody did a phenomenal job. They did, but just that moment was was special just because of the way the dynamic flowed, of the way it like, worked out. You know what I'm agree, saying? It was it was perfectly. Time. I didn't I didn't make it. It wasn't supposed to be like that. Well, it was, but I didn't know what happened like that. No, it was. It but was, it was like really powerful. July fireworks. It was really powerful. It was. it was like we just building. building what if I run out building. of stuff building. to talk about? You never run out of stuff to talk about. I know your whole <laughs> life, and we just talk for two hours. And it's so much more. And there's more. We ain't even uh, scratched the surface yet. And you know, when I did my first Truck and Hustle, uh, although it did a it did great in uh, impact and reviews, you know, I had only shared with you like I was really going through something major in my life. I was yeah. going through a major transition, you know, everything that I felt like I had worked for in my career, I felt like was being taken from me. And I was fighting for something again that I did that's not mine. Mm. And I was so hyped for the position that I had in the title. You ever feel like you climbing this mountain, you climbing this mountain, you finally get to the top of the mountain. You're like, I did, I did that was the top of this mountain. That's how I felt. And then I was looking across seeing all these other mountains, like this shit ain't even all that. <laughs> right. And it's crazy that it took for a senior leader of a company to call me a nigga mm. to knock me down the size. Like, girl, you tripping. Like, this ain't even the mountain. You don't own this. This is not yours. You are so overly passionate about somebody else's thing that you forgot that you have it in you, that you have your own thing, your own spark. Right. That nobody even seeing. And people people make a lot of um, statements, especially ever since the murder of George Floyd, about, I wish somebody would 
you know, do something racist to me at my job. You have, do you understand what you have to undergo and from a mental capacity to endure something like that? I felt like somebody punched me in my gut. And as soon as I felt better, they kept punching me again. Mm. So words hurt for real. Like people are staking stones or break my bones. Shut that shit up. We not five. Mm. Like for someone to call you a nigga after you've put so much work and effort into a title and a position and the betterment of an organization, both financially and organizationally. And it was like, I can't believe that even happened to me. It really felt like I got jumped. Mm. For real. Like, it was taking me a so long to get up from that. Even though I had started Agate and Agate was doing well and I was making an impact, I was, I was before a little before that, I was still fighting to stay. Like, no, this is mine. You're not going to make me leave mine. Anybody that's listening to this, don't be so attached to somebody else's something that you missed that God has created you for something. There's a spark in you that somebody is missing because you hype about somebody else's creativity. Right. Or somebody else's ownership. You are equally as great or better. Don't miss that. And it wasn't just that. It was the nigga thing. Somebody called me Osama bin Shaq. And, to so, and it was it was downplay. Like, well, you've allowed people to call you Shaq in the workplace. So you've already welcomed silly play names. No, that's not silly play name. Mm-hmm. Shaq is a derivative of Shaquana, S-H-A-Q. Right. And Shaq was given to me by a group of business professionals in China that just couldn't pronounce the Q-U sound because it was Ka instead of Kwa. So I was okay with Shaq. Right. They asked me first. So it wasn't disrespect. And now I exude Shaq, right? Because we know Shaq, the basketball player, like he, you know, he dominate the paint. I see myself the same way. Yes, there's other experts, but nobody going to give it up the way I give it up. Period. I know that. I know that and I accept that. And I accept the responsibility to come with it. Because the responsibility is I got to give it up like that all the time. Mm. You can't be a dope ass basketball player and then you whack. Later, like you gotta come through MVP. At, LeBron gotta be MVP for life. When he right. retire, he better be able to do the same thing he did. That's a fact. Or what they gonna talk about when he fell off? They'll forget all them years. Just like that, or and talk everybody about is that the last year when he was trash. You ain't yes. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. That's so true. It's, it's real true. That's so true. So I had dealt with that. I, so it was like Osama bin Shaq. Then I dealt with that. Then, you know, I think a lot of us struggled during the George Floyd time too because we was dealing with uh, people insens- insensitivity around that. People at work was talking to me like, oh, yeah, did you see those riots? I'm like, did you see that murder? Mm. Oh, no, that guy stole cigarettes. Like, we're not doing this. right? So you find yourself, you're the only all the time. I don't know. I can't speak for everybody else, but I have always been the only something. Either the only Shaquana or the only black girl or the only female or the only something. And some people thrive in those places and i think i've done well in them but sometimes the only comes with loneliness or the only comes with you got a pioneer i don't think that rosa park wanted to be a pioneer i think she was just tired that day mm. and that she turned into her right yeah, yeah that right was day. <laughs> so i didn't look to be my, my students jokingly call me the harriet tugman of this right it's hilarious every time they say it right i don't own that because yeah. that's that's just too big yeah, yeah, right that's yeah. too big Way too big for me to even digest and, and take on as something of myself. But the point that I'm trying to make is we don't always set out to pioneer anything. We set out sometimes to either make a living or survive. And that turns into maybe impact in one or two. And then before you know it, you have the responsibility of making sure that somebody else could win. And you didn't ask for that. I ain't asked for that. But what I'm supposed to do now? Hmm. What I'm supposed to do now? Right? You know, Peter had to walk on water, right? And the wind had to blow. And he had to make a determination as to he's going to continue to be trusting God or he was going to let the wind waver his faith. And whenever something get rough for me, that's the thing that comes back to my mind. Like, I've been walking on water all this time. My story, and I still haven't even told it all. One day we'll do that. But the story that I have, that's supernatural favor. Like, there's no way I did this by myself. And all of us have something that we can reflect on in our life. Like, yo, I don't even know how I got through that. And when you can remember those moments, everything else don't even seem like it's that hard no more. Like, man, this shit is easy. Mm. Because I got through boom, 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 boom. 
And and I mean, sometimes my strength re- resides in knowing that I'm not really doing this by myself or in my own might at all. No doubt. I said I was done. I really am now. Let's get out of here, Shaq. Yeah, I think home. we uh I think we came, we saw, we conquered. We, we do always we, do. We did what we had to do. Oh man. You could clip this into 15 things. <laughs> <laughs> another one, another one. What we had in time? Like an hour? Don't fi- tell me. Th- 45, two hours? Two really? hours. Why we do it? Well, it's officially, as far as the podcast, the hour is over. Yeah. 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 Yeah.